The following interview was conducted with Bill Curry for the Purdue University Electronic Resources a Licensing Librarian for the Purdue University All History Program. It took place on uh, Tuesday, April the 22nd, 2008, in Stewart B. 26. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the All History Librarian. Welcome. Tell us a little bit about mm -hmm. where you were born and your parents and siblings and early years. Well, um, I've never gotten out of Indiana. <laughs> um, I was born in Bedford, Indiana. What year were you born in? <laughs> Let me think, 1939. <laughs> um, my parents' names were um, Mildred and Harry Corey. And um, we lived in Bedford for probably, basically grew up in Bedford around that area, but we lived in Bedford until I was probably about 10 or 12 years old. And then we moved out into the country. My dad was all interested in farming and cattle and such things, so I got very much involved in that um, and uh, never did particularly care for that, that lifestyle, <laughs> but um, we had a good, good you time go to, growing up. Where did up. you go to grade school and high school? Tell us a little about that. Um, in grade school, I went to the big old building that was right in the middle of downtown Bedford, typical old school building. Uh, I think it was called Central. <laughs> uh, and then uh, there was another uh, grade school in Ball, I believe it was called Parkview uh, Grade School. And uh, in high school, I started at Bedford and when we moved into the, uh, out into the country, I ended up at a little school called Olytic. That is a type of limestone. That was uh, um, uh, named after a type of limestone that they um, cut and mined in that area. In that area, which Bedford, of course, is famous for. So, mm -hmm. my grandfather uh, was a stone cutter who ran one of these big lathe machines to make the big columns that uh, were put in many of the buildings. He told me, at least, around Washington D.C. and in New York City and out east. So. Uh, a lot of that stuff comes from Bedford. All right, yeah. Were you, uh, in high school, were you in any student activities, athletics or anything? Well, it was a very small school. The athletics I was in, I did play basketball. Uh, my uh, father, that was the only thing he would let me play because it was in the wintertime and we didn't have to do anything on the farm. Uh, so I did get to play basketball and I, I, I did pretty good with that. Uh, we didn't win a lot of games, but uh, we had a lot of fun. So, sure. Yeah. How large was this? How large was your class? I think there were about twenty-five people in the senior class. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, tell us about going on to college. Well, um, I, I guess it was just sort of an assumption. None of my family had ever been to college before, uh, but it was an assumption that I would go, and uh, it was just part of it. And uh, I started out. I came to Purdue. Um, and I started out in the School of Agriculture thinking that I wanted to go into some kind of um, biological or agricultural chemistry. And uh, I um, did that. It was, it was okay. I did that for about two years and decided that really wasn't what I was uh, that interested in. And in the meantime, I had, uh, had to take some foreign language got interested in that, and that's what I ended up finally getting a degree in, in foreign languages. I had a lot of Spanish and German, uh, ended up uh, then teaching high school after that. That was sort of a uh, stop and start thing too because um, the job I was offered, I, I did not have a teaching degree. I had my undergraduate degree but no that professional teaching semester. So I taught high school for a year and then came back to Purdue to get my teaching license. <laughs> um, and that was the point at which I got interested in libraries. I had a little part-time job in the libraries here at Purdue and uh, they had a special program that sort of pushed me into the whole library profession. Well, where did you live on campus? Tell us a little about campus life and were you in a fraternity? Um, yes. Um, the first year I lived in a dorm with my best friend from Bedford. Uh, he did not stay and ended up going to IU, going back down near uh, Bloomington, or uh, because Bedford is near Bloomington, of course, going sort of going back home and went to IU. 
Um, but we lived in the uh, dorm the first year, and the second year I pledged at uh, farmhouse fraternity, which would be typical in, uh, with the agricultural background. <clears throat> so um, let's see, I was there for two years, and then some friends of mine that I met here uh, in, in, an, in another fraternity moved into an apartment situation um, here in town. Okay. That's were any student up. activities that you participated in clubs when you were here? Yes, but can I remember? Was there a club called Skull and Crescent? Yes, I was involved with that. I also was very interested in uh, some of the activities and um, that used to go on over in the Union. Uh, I, th I forget what the name of it was, but we produced a lot of uh, uh, poster board advertisements and just sort of general uh, things that were that advertise student activities. Sure, and right. I can't remember the name. Like of a it. printing service of some yeah. sort. Yeah. Okay. But it was a club. It yeah. was more, it was a student organization. I can't remember that. It seemed like yeah. I, I don't I don't remember. <laughs> then so continue on. You got interested in the library, and then what transpired after that? Um, Did you get an offer to this well when, you when, came I, to when I, I was I when, when I came back to work on that that uh, professional teaching degree or semester. I think that was the year that I had a part-time job in the libraries, in the acquisitions department, I believe, and uh, found out about a program that was being offered at that point. Now, what year would that have been? 60? Somewhere in the 60s, because you got your MLS four. in six, 1968. Yeah. So it's probably in the mid-60s, I think. Um, 64, 65. Um, for some reason at that point, um, academic libraries were having lots of trouble finding uh, uh, professional librarians that had a, an accredited professional library degree. Uh, I, I don't remember the reason why there was a shortage, uh, but that was the case. And uh, the um, director here at the time, John Moriarty, uh, sort of invented this program where he would choose, select people that were interested in library science and end up basically paying for their whole education at IU, which was the only library school I believe in Indiana at the time. Um, and the way that worked was that you were assigned a job here, a full-time job here in the libraries doing some aspect of library work. And we moved around uh, to different areas, but we'd usually stay a whole semester in a particular place. Um, and then in the summer following that academic year, um, we would go to IU and go to school all, uh, all summer. And so that's what I did for about three summers uh, ending up, I believe I got my degree in 69 or 70, which was a uh, master's in library science. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't go any further than that. I didn't go ahead and get a PhD, but that was the point at which sure. I got. And then our, there, our only obligation, the only obligation that we had was uh, to work at Purdue in the libraries here for two more years after we got our degree. And of course, I thought I would do that, and then uh, the next job would be the Librarian of Congress or something like that. But anyway, it was very interesting here. Um, um, uh, I was put into jobs that I liked, and I decided to stay. And I apparently they wanted me to stay, <laughs> so um, um, I. I well, as you know, I have stayed here from that point on, never really planning to do right. that in the beginning. But that's what happened. Were there, there were some other li were some other librarians that were going through the program at the same time with you? Do you recall? Uh, there were. Was John Halkus one of them? No, I think he had already. Finished. I think he had just finished okay. that. What about and was Mary Gibbs? Uh, Mary Gibbs, I, I believe, either started after I finished or started in the middle of my my term. Uh, Ron Boley. Ron Boley from the regional who, campus. Yeah, who ended up working in the regional campuses for several years. Sure. Yeah. And um, K. 
can't think yeah. of anyone. There was somebody who was working in the catalog department that had just graduated, and I can't remember his um, name. Wasn't Dennis Parks another one that went to that? Dennis point? was after me, I okay. believe. But he was one of the... So he there and were Mary Gibbs were, sure. were two people that right. I think were sort of after I had gotten right. started. Right. I believe that's the way yeah. it worked. What about, were you, mm -hmm. were you married at the time then when you, came, when you were in library school? Uh, yes, I was. Just right after, um, I, uh, right after the undergraduate degree that I got here. Um, Did yeah, you meet your wife here? No, I met her um, back home again. We we had known each other in high school, but really never did you know didn't date or anything like that. So, but I, I can't remember. I was back home one summer and we met each other and it sort of blossomed. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Excuse me. Let me. <clears throat> Now go ahead. We'll start a little bit with really library automation is one that you've been pretty much involved in. And one of the first things I think that the library did was that uh, union list of serials in 74. You remember that printout list that they yeah. did? Don Hammer was involved in yeah, that. Yeah, Don Hammer. Um, well, first of all, I didn't start out with automation. Of course, there, there wasn't much automation. I remember taking a class in library school at IU. Um, I believe they just called it programming, and we played with a bunch of punch cards. <laughs> it's what it amounted to. <laughs> um, uh, but anyway, when I came back here, the first assignment was in um, the engineering libraries. And I believe I was there maybe two or three years. And then that was the point at which Joe Dagnese, the director that replaced John Moriarty, um, offered offered me a job to come to the automation area. Now that had already sort of started, but it wasn't very defined at that point. It wasn't real mm -hmm. clear as to what what all was going to be done. But there was sort of a relationship there between what they called the research unit and a um, and the automation. It was sort of combined at that time. I, you know, people didn't really understand what we were getting into. I don't think. And so that first catalog, that union, was that the one you mentioned? Yes, union, the union list of the serials. serials. Purdue got the contract for that. Right, and it was a state project right. that had all of the academic libraries around right. the state uh, involved, and they would contribute. Um, I'm pretty sure they, they contributed uh, records of their holdings just in paper format. They were just sheets of paper or bound <laughs> material. And we had a unit here that um, did all the key punching. Maybe no one remembers what key punching was, <laughs> but it's punching little holes in cards <laughs> that computers could Tell recognize. the researchers what it was, <laughs> yes. Um, but we had, I believe, three or four people who sat there all day, punched data on the card, and then somebody took the card and verified it, repunched it again, and matched up the cards to the verifier. It was a, a long project. A bad job. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, something I read said the reason Purdue got the contract was because you they were already doing some work in machine readable format prior. At yeah, about Don the same Hammer time. had been doing some things along those lines. So you were sort of moving in that yeah, direction. Yeah, and. Um, uh, Don, I can't remember. He must have left at about that time. I don't remember where Don went. It was seemed like it was another Big Ten school. Um, and that's probably why I was offered the job. I can't remember what the sequence of events was. Okay. But uh, yeah, he had, been, he had been working on that and actually was sort of well known around the country uh, for that work. And uh, then, um, as you say, Purdue got that little project, uh, sure. and uh, that took, we spent two or three years on that. I'm, I'm well, sure it was a, a long time. There were a lot of libraries. Were the public libraries involved? As no, well? I believe it was Just only the academic, academic libraries. Academic libraries, okay, not the special libraries. No, no. Okay. 
And I remember uh, making several trips to different libraries around the state, uh, making sure that what they were sending us was correct and having some right. heated discussions with some of them. They didn't think we were getting something done or not done or we weren't doing it the way they liked it or something. So, uh, But through that, I developed a lot of friendships <laughs> with these people. <laughs> right. Well, we'll continue on then. You sort of got more involved in automation and information retrieval and Yeah, they, everything started to... Uh, to blossom a little bit at that point, I think. Um, was the direct, was the director involved, uh, really supportive of this? Yes, although I don't believe uh, he he. Of course, as as he should have been, he was more involved with uh, talking with other people around the state to see what kind of uh, funding we could get to start really expanding some of these sure. things, um, and that some of. I believe our first attempt at the catalog stuff. You know, I really can't remember which one sure. came first on some of these. Um, well, there was the uh, what, what, informa the EIS that infor engineering information system that came along about in the early eighties. That uh, yeah, that the that, schools, that, I think, that was sort of a a side operation that the the libraries. The engineering library. We, we, we sort of cooperated with them, but that was mostly an engineering school right. cooperation with the engineering library. Right. And at the same time, the people, the staff that we started putting in place here to start looking at a, a system-wide catalog uh, started developing the system that eventually, I believe we called it Look or something like that. Right. Right. And those sort of develop side by side. Right. Um, They're about the same time. Yeah. And we got to the point with that system of, I think we had it so people could log on to a terminal somewhere and be able to search the catalog. Of course, there was nothing graphical about any of this. It was, you know, purely text. And um, uh, you had to log on through some kind of, uh, I forget what the communication system was at the time uh, that was used to uh, connect the uh, terminals. But we got it to that point. The engineering EIS program had their own little catalog going. They were sort of running side by side. Mm -hmm. Well, then we had to decide what direction we were, gonna, we were going to go and where we were going to get the money in order to really, truly develop a campus-wide catalog system. And at that point, programmers were real um, jealous, I guess, about the work they were doing. And um, they didn't want to go out, even if there was something available, and buy somebody else's system. They wanted to uh, do their own. They wanted to invent their own. That was uh, very common then. They were, of course, you know, the pride in that work of doing that. And that went on for two or three years because we, we needed a lot more money to develop that. And there was no money at the university, at least we weren't able to pry it loose, uh, to do that. So at one point, at some point, that was all turned over to the higher education What's the name of the group in Indiana? The Indiana uh, Higher, uh, Board Commission Higher, on Higher Commission. Education. They're the ones that more or less approve budgets. Used to be and so hissy, on. right? Yeah. Uh, for higher education, and um, they were able to put together a program which included all of the state universities, but everybody had to use the same system. We could all have our separate system, but it had to be the same system. And that system, as you probably remember, was called Notice. Uh, it was based on a monstrous mainframe operation that was, uh, the computer itself was housed in Puck. That's what it was called at that, at that time. Um, we spent several million dollars to buy that machine. And uh, then uh, terminals uh, uh, to search and terminals to check out materials were placed in all the libraries. 
And there, there wasn't a whole lot of um, access for people out in their offices at that point. It was mostly just for the library system. You had to come in and use the catalog. You had to come into the, into the library to use the catalog. A lot of money was spent on that. It was pretty cumbersome. It took a lot of support for the machine, for the big mainframe machine and the software that went with it. So, but we we stayed with that system for a few years until um, we until the technology had developed into a client server operation, which was based on a much smaller, I believe we called them at that time, uh, mini computer type uh, servers. And uh, uh, we went through a process of choosing a new system, and uh, that's where we are today with, mm -hmm. with a lot of refinements. But we, uh, the main thing, the main, I think we ended up selling the mainframe, or Puck sold it, I believe. For two hundred dollars, and then probably we'd pay sure. three million for it. <laughs> Wasn't that that's where Soar, the name Soar came in? Was the notice system when Soar had the Soar yeah. in nineteen eighty nine, yeah. and yeah. they launched it. It was down in the underground library. Mm -hmm. What about training the staff? That I believe was a, it. What did that stand for? The online resource. resource I yeah, believe yeah. there was a there was a contest in the yeah. library to select mm -hmm. it, and this is the one that won. Mm -hmm. What about uh, training? Did you were you people that in technology were you doing training of the staff? To, to how to operate the uh, one system? Yeah, was it was mostly up to us, although the system that we bought, the notice system, um, of course, they, they was, it was a commercial company at, by that, at that point, even though that software was developed at Northwestern originally. Uh, this was a commercial uh, operation at that point, and they had people that would come out and train and uh, provide that kind of service. But, of course, we... we um, we had some people here who developed a lot of good expertise. Alan Manifold was one that developed a lot of expertise in that system, and so he began to be known around the country for uh, uh, his expertise, and he would do some training. Sure. So, Norm Langston was another one that was involved mm -hmm. in that, uh, doing some of the computer work, too, mm -hmm. uh, and others that, that have worked with. Then how did your duties, how did you, and you, you sort of moved in, and handled all the automation, the information, Things technology because at well, one time I believe you said you'd been you know I um, that was that uh, a lot of that had to do with uh, with the fact why I stayed here a long time because I was able to get involved with a lot of different things at that point and the um, director Donyezi and people and directors or I guess it was uh, Emily Mobley the latest. Um, I was able to move around into different areas and I had different responsibilities and so during that time uh, there was a lot of combination of activities uh, uh, running the, um, the automation operation I think even the uh, research unit at some point which was uh, um, well there, 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 some of the people in the research unit were more or less working with faculty around the system to do information science type projects. Um, I was involved with running technical services which did all of the cataloging and acquisitions and so it was sort of back and forth in and out however we arranged the administrative activities was, was how I was able to well, having that catalog uh, liaison and contact <coughs> help because that catalog was the online and you needed right. your expertise there helped a little bit with right, the uh, right. putting it into technology's format. I, I always saw it as sort of a side comment. Uh, I always thought that um, the automation and the online catalog that we see today especially is the thing that finally made the system of libraries that we have on the Purdue campus really work because it did, it no longer made you go to a particular library to get the information. It was the perfect solution for our kind of library. So um, I doubt if we'll ever see a main library because of automation. I don't right. think that, that it opens the access. Happen. It's available whenever you want it. Uh, right. You don't have to right. be physically physically there. And it, it was really interesting during those times when during that transition, some of the funny ideas and how threatened people around in the libraries and even the academic departments 
how threatened they were about somehow or other this automation taking something away from them. It was it was interesting. really interesting, yeah. you know, and it was such a pleasure to when we would have training sessions and we would meet with, if we could get a few academic, discipline-oriented faculty there, they they were a little reluctant to come, but if we could get them there, it was really satisfying to see all of a sudden the light come on as to what they could do with this stuff. <laughs> Look what I've got, right? Yeah. What I bring to the table. Yeah. 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 Well, uh, one thing I did want to ask you about in Colsa, uh, uh, we helped tell them what in Colsa was, and the library helped with the establishment of that. For the researchers, I'm yeah. thinking about in Colsa because that still goes on today. That, well, uh, in Colsa, it stands for Indiana Cooperative Library Services Authority, a real funny name. Nobody would know what it was. But it stands for, that, that's what it stands and for. And you've been involved with it. Yeah, I was pretty much involved with it from the beginning. Uh, it was um, set up, do, do you remember what year it was? Did you have any? Oh, maybe in the 80s or something like that, I think, Somewhere because we used to go down there for training sessions, and so that's when Becky came along. So it's probably mm -hmm. in the 80s. But the idea was to um, have a um, sort of a service organization that could uh, provide training and services right. and access and cooperation and communication. Uh, among all the libraries within the state. Among all of the libraries. And it was a little unique then because it took in all kinds of libraries, right. uh, academic, special libraries and companies, uh, public, public and school libraries. I, you know, I believe that covers them all. Uh, so th th that also caused some problems for it too because there were different kinds of libraries had uh, a lot of different needs, sure. so it, you know there there was a lot of um, organizational work to do there. But that has um, I served on the um, the administrative board of that for a few years, and what's interesting is that I was there during G Jim Mullins, who is our current dean of libraries, was there during the same time. We served on the board at the same time. Now, he went off a different direction and didn't stay in Indiana, and now he's back, of course. Right. But um, we knew each other uh, during that time, and, and I remember being a good experience then, too. Mm -hmm. um, but that, uh, we had a, a, in Colsa also hired a director at that point that was well known in the country, her name was Barbara Markison, right. did a lot of work at the Library of Congress and was very good for for that, um, for for getting that all set up and making it meaningful here in the state, uh, there were a lot of um, there were a lot of small libraries that benefited an awful lot right. from that. Now the larger libraries, you know, we had a lot of the the uh, services already, like training, and uh, but the larger libraries took advantage of that through its relationship and representation to this organization called the Ohio College Library. Uh, OCLC. Uh -huh. I forget what the last C stood for, but it's, right. it's now known as OCLC, right. which was a national organization providing uh, machine-readable cooperative cataloging. Uh, that's how it started, anyway. Cooperative cataloging to libraries around the country so that if one library created a bibliographic record to put into machine readable form, every other library who was a member could could use that record and not have to reinvent the wheel every time uh, they wanted sure. to add a, right. add new yeah. material to their libraries. So, in Colsa, sort of started with the relationship with OCLC providing those services and helping libraries in Indiana get started on those, and then expanded more into. Um, Training and, sure, and, right. uh, and I, I think now they're as much involved in uh, uh, you know workstation type training and services the, for small libraries as anything else. Right. So. Um, what about the regional campuses? Did you have, they were brought in on the, uh, the the systems that we have here? Well, the uh, two, yeah, two, two of them were the only two uh, regional campuses that um, were involved with on that system are the uh, Calumet and the North Central up in the northwest part of the state. You might want to mention to the researchers why uh, IUPUI and uh, Fort Wayne were not. 
Well, um, so I've never quite understood why Fort Wayne is. That, that's sort of a funny operation there. I think Purdue runs it, but IU runs the library or something like that. But anyway, the IUPUI is really a, uh, a joint operation of IU and Purdue, mm -hmm. and IU definitely has the responsibility for running the library sure. there. So That clarifies it for the researchers since yeah. they know that there are other campuses other than those two. Yeah. And it's um, that's, that's always been a bit of a problem, especially at IUPUI, because it's hard for people to understand when we start talking about all these electronic resources that um, we license, especially nowadays, uh, why that they don't have access to them and, and we do and vice versa. And it's because uh, that when we license materials here, we license them for this campus and for our two regional campuses because right, okay. we have the responsibility for the library services. So, right. Why don't you, for the researchers, tell a little about some of the things that you're doing now with a lot of the, the databases and getting licensed because uh, they use our, the catalog and they know there's just a lot available. Yeah, it's, 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 How it's, changed. it's, it's sort of a mystery to most people because uh, the, 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 the uh, what, current wisdom of most people using the Internet thinks that uh, it's on the Internet. It means not free. <laughs> uh, so there's a whole lot of work and a whole lot of expense uh, involved in licensing a, uh, an electronic resource like full text access to journal, to all journal articles. Uh, databases like, uh, what would one that everybody would uh, recognize, uh, LexisNexis. Uh, so a lot of the engineering things, a lot of the humanities things, um, and uh, they could be bibliographic or they could refer to full text. And then all of the relationships and linking that puts together full text with the bibliographic part and all of this. Anyway, all that has to be licensed. It's not like buying a book. Um, uh, every piece of uh, ele every electronic resource that we purchase, like a database, a, access to journals, uh, a bibliographic uh, access, uh, access to electronic books now, that's, that's of course the latest thing that uh, we're seeing more and more of. All that has to have a license. Uh, and uh, I've often thought I needed to go back and get a, um, con a legal, legal contracting degree, get a law degree, but, uh, <laughs> but um, that's becoming a little more straightforward as the publishers realize what the libraries need as far as making things accessible and, uh, and us realizing what probably some of the publishers need to protect themselves. So, uh, so that's what I'm doing right now, and uh, even though I'm half-time retired at this point, uh, that's uh, how I spend my time. Uh, and, that, and that really grew out of uh, when I went to the halftime requirement, uh, retirement and uh, gave up on the automation, got out of the automation uh, uh, administration and so on. Um, at that point, you read a lot of software licenses, and so, and so somebody thought that if I could read those, I could do that. <laughs> <laughs> Your the data licenses, so that's how that's yeah. how this grew about. What about the audiovisual center? Did, did uh, were, you, did, were you involved at all with any of the electronic work with that, or they not, brought they just brought the catalog in? Yeah, not really. That was another little um, um, catalog development that went on at that time that they sort of did on their own. Right. Uh, it was a small, you know, it was a small operation that was just being done down there, and that was. That when we uh, moved to the bigger system, uh, that was all integrated into, sure. um, right. into okay. the bigger system. So, how about serials? The uh, serials cancellation project—that was a big thing, wasn't it? It was, but I don't think I was involved right. with uh, but, much uh, of that. It was one of the first ones we've ever had. Was, yeah. Yeah. yeah, one of the things yeah. I wanted to ask you about. Let's, ho let's hope we don't have to do that again. Right, I know. <laughs> In 1970, do you remember the Industrial and Technical Information Service? Yeah, tell us I a little do. bit about that. Was um, well, again, that was back in the 80s, wasn't it? No, about 1970 is when it got was started. It, was it yeah. that early? Right. It's a state, it was a state technical services program, and I remember that because yes. I know you were somewhat involved with yeah. that. Um, this was before any kind of automation. I do know that uh, because, um, um, well, let me tell you what it was. It was a federal 
program called State Technical Services, and, I, and, and the, the whole idea of it was to encourage um, relationships between universities who were doing research and, and had a lot of expertise in areas and developing economic development of companies around the state. Um, and so each state administered a type of a program, and at Purdue we had the uh, Industrial and Technical Information Service. I remember that, right. And this was way and, before we provided yeah. the online database searching like oh, that. Yeah. Oh yeah, there was no computer stuff at that point. Mm -mm. And um, the library's part of that, uh, the small part of that was that a company from around the state could, if they needed sort of a basic, uh, basic information on a particular topic or something they were getting involved with to develop or research or whatever, uh, we could do um, uh, searches in the bibliographic and library literature for them to, to provide, usually it was a, a lot of references, uh, journal articles that they, and we would, we would make mm -hmm. the act, we'd copy the article and send sure. a whole packet of materials off to them. Um, and all that was done manually, just like we, we had right. no, we had no uh, online or any kind of um, database access that we have now. That right. was all done in paper <laughs> indexing and abstracting tools. Right. That we was had it in just libraries. to serve companies in the state? Was that a way it was set up? Or could uh, other libraries use it or not? Well, was I don't remember cost? doing it for other libraries. Was there a cost? Now, my involvement was that was the library part of that. that was another little chunk of things uh, okay. before I got involved with automation. When I was when I was involved more with the engineering part of that. Right. So I would have been in the seventies, yeah. early seventies. Um, there was no no cost to the re uh, no. There was no cost at all to them, and I, I can't remember. It seemed like we did that for three or four years. And I think the engineering part of that, which would, uh, a company could actually ask somebody to do a little piece of research for them, or a faculty member could go out and visit the company and advise them on certain things like that. I think it went on for a few years longer. I bet the whole program didn't go much beyond sure. five or six. Did you do the years. whole thing yourself, or did you have the? Yeah, there manager? was nobody. There was nobody with so, me. You know, I could use uh, some people in the engineering libraries to maybe do a little work to help or out. Or make the copies, or yeah, whatever needed yeah. to be done. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I, I I remember wandering around a lot all over campus trying to find uh, <laughs> sources to do the research with. Um, and then today, and what, what's interesting about that is that. Um, What's it been? Maybe about ten years ago now. There was a whole new program started that was very similar to that, and I'm not sure where the funding. I think that was the funding from that came directly from the state to Purdue, uh, and that's when the libraries opened up another similar operation called the Technical Information Service. It was a very similar operation. Gordon Law is the one that got that yes. up and running. That's right. And uh, of course, at that time, we had all these computers to work with and uh, a lot of search tools, uh, online search tools. So, right. Uh, it was a whole different way, and it yeah. made more sense then, yeah. of course. About engineering, you might want to mention for the researchers, <clears throat> there were more engineering libraries this is long before Potter was mm -hmm. built, so that you moved to uh, the libraries were affiliated with the school and actually housed right. within the right. school. Almost every school had a library. Right. Uh, and then and when, some of them were awfully small. Right. And then when the Potter Center consolidated mm -hmm. all of the libraries on that. I don't. Um, we could try to we could try to name which schools went in with that. But, uh, Just about but basically all of the engineering libraries went into the Potter's. That's right, center. yeah. Now you were served under several library directors, you know, starting mm -hmm. with Mr. Moriarty and Dagnese. And then during the interim between Moriarty and Dagnese was that interim with Dean Hawkins and there mm -hmm. was a committee that, you know, handled that. I don't and then, remember much about that because that was a little before I was. Sure, uh, and then uh, Dagnese was here for a long time until he passed away in 89 mm -hmm. and then Emily and Jim Mullins. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah that's, each have their little different things. Yeah, and, yeah. I guess I have worked with all of them, and they they were definitely all different. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. <laughs> okay. Uh, how about fundraising? New, the remember the Centennial Fund drive in 1969 for the new library. However, that money <laughs> we had to wait a little longer for that. 
Then they have uh, I, you know, I, th but now I don't think we were, I don't really think the library was all that involved. I think it was a piece of the overall right. thing, and it ended up, for whatever reason, I, I mean, I was not directly involved with it, but uh, it ended up being that the library ended up with like 13 cents or something. It was, it just, it just never, it just never worked. Yeah. Uh, the university, of course, was successful, but building a new central library was not a priority then. Right. And actually it never has been because of the, the evidently old philosophy that Purdue has always had about keeping the materials, the library materials, close, close to, the, to where the people sure. are working. Right. So. Yeah. And then library, the automation has really grown a lot. Yeah. In the, in the more, in the, more so in the late 90s and early in mm -hmm. the year 2000. Well, That's it's what? just like it's just like the rest of the world. I mean, right. we're taking advantage of everything we can, or we, right. we uh, yeah. We're taking advantage of everything we can uh, along those lines. Uh, sometimes we probably do things we don't need to do. <laughs> but we do them anyway, <laughs> but, right? Uh, yeah. if you can do it <laughs> with yeah. a computer, you try what to about, do it. No, it's not really yeah. that bad. Do you have a favorite Purdue tradition? And also, how about an outstanding event in your life? You think uh, of that. A Purdue tradition. Well, um, since I've been here, even from an undergraduate, I don't think I saw the first one. And I certainly don't go to those races anymore, but the Grand Prix, the, the go-kart, I remember my freshman year uh, uh, going to that, and that, that had to be, that had to be the first or second, third year that they did that. Uh, and so every time that I see that announced, this is Grand Prix weekend, uh, I think about Going the there. scene of that first year. But where, where was it? It was in the mall, uh, where the uh, engineering mall. That's where they started, wasn't that? Where you would have yeah, gone, not not um, out on the track as it is today. Yeah, no, it wasn't on the track. The first, yeah, where where I my, my memory of all that was, was on the street, uh, there in front of the uh, the old power plant, the street that had a tree, plant in front in the middle of it. Right. They raced around that. The Louisville there. That's right. Yeah. You're correct on that. And last year was the 50th anniversary of it, so. Yeah. Was it? Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Um, what about family? Can you tell us what, what did your children go to, uh, to Purdue? Um, and get, one yeah. of them did. Okay. You know. <clears throat> um, yeah, what, our, daughter? Our, well, let me, let me talk yeah. about my son first. Okay. Uh, he, um, he, um, bo both of them went to the local schools. Both of them went to McCutcheon High School here locally. Uh, my son was sort of a athlete. He was sort of a jock, and uh, he didn't always study the best as he should. So he ended up going to uh, Vincennes for two years, um, sort of learning how to study and learning how to play the game of uh, the academic game. And then he came back to Purdue and got a degree in um, in uh, uh, What's it called now? The Western Hotel and Restaurant. Oh, HTM, uh, Hospitality yeah, Tourism HB, Management. HB, HB, right. He got uh -huh. a degree in that. Um, um, and it went very well. I mean, those two, those two, the sort of the junior college start and here went, went very well. Uh, so he ended up doing that. Uh, he currently works, um, or he had for several years worked for the Chicago Tribune. So, uh, uh, he has moved to a company in Indianapolis now. But then my daughter, she went to um, the IU Nursing School um, in Indianapolis, and uh, but only went for two years and decided that wasn't for her and ended up coming back to this area and uh, marrying a uh, farmer. And now they run a big uh, farm operation here in uh, Tippecanoe County. Uh, that uh, I think is very, very successful, and especially this year, they're making lots of money, I think. Uh, uh, finally, the farmers are being rewarded for all of this work they do. <laughs> it's coming back, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you, uh, would, any um, outstanding event that you want to share with the researchers? Can you think about one? Here in the libraries? Well, I mean, there's, it's, it's, not a, it's not a particular event. Um, one of the um, memories, of course, I have uh, is uh, I was in the um, 
the electrical engineering building. I don't believe it's called that anymore, but over on the mall. And uh, that was during the uh, 70s when all of the uh, demonstrations and so on. And I remember looking out the window there and seeing all these groups marching on the executive building. Uh, and at the same time, they were out there building this nuclear accelerator <laughs> in this big hole. So I had a, a view of all kinds of stuff going on. That was, that was just what I thought. But the, the, the biggest event, obviously, is the computerization of libraries. I mean, it has just totally, totally changed how we do business. And I mean, the rest of the world, it's changed it too. Right. But yeah. with the libraries, we, the libraries have really been able to take advantage of uh, what that offers, and uh, it is just, it's just improved things so much. It's just amazing. And you can get a, a look at it from standing mm -hmm. back and, and moving forward with it. You get kind of a, mm -hmm. an overview of it. Yeah, which yeah, is really good of, from the whole thing developed. Yeah, right. yeah, it was it was very interesting. It was awfully, awfully frustrating in many points. Um, uh, I remember uh, for several years, not too long ago, uh, that. Um, after the computers became embedded in your sort of daily life and how to use them, that, um, that uh, everything that went wrong, of course, in the libraries, it was, it was the computer department's fault. <laughs> so we had a lot of troubleshooting to do, and this, and this of course, it wasn't quite as dependable then as it is now. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what are your plans now when you do uh, when you finally do retire? Do you know what you're going to be going to stay in the community? Well, I'm stay we're staying here in this area. Um, we we don't have any plans other than trying to do a little bit of traveling as much as I can. Sure. Uh, we have uh, we have grandchildren in the area. We have uh, one right now who is playing football uh, in college, and we like to go watch those games. Sure. We, and so. Uh, you keep busy just just doing that. That's uh, right. So okay. um, uh, we're not planning on going too far. I, I, re I really sort of feel bad about never living outside of Indiana, but it's been a good life. <laughs> oh, any closing comments that you'd like to share with the researchers? That you, in thinking back or something special? Well, uh, uh, just generally, even though obviously there have been rocky times in everybody's life and everybody's career, uh, Purdue has really been a good place to work, uh, and I think they, they, they treat people well. And uh, I have just really been uh, challenged by the number of different things that I've been able to be involved with, and, and it sure, sure keeps life a lot more interesting than just doing absolutely the same thing right. all these years. And I guess I have to thank uh, the directors and deans that uh, they provided those opportunities. Right. So uh, uh, I've, I've been very happy at Purdue. I, I uh, don't know why everybody doesn't want to come here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you, Bill. Okay. I appreciate that. Okay. Thank you very much. <clears throat> very good. Uh,